In this lecture, we're going to learn more about natural selection and specifically talk about the different postulates that are part of natural selection. So let's just, um, a quick reminder though, that it was Charles Darwin who first came up with the idea of natural selection. However, he didn't publish on it for about 20 years. He, he waited until also another man, Alfred Russell Wallace, also came up with this idea. And so jointly they published their first paper together on, on this idea. And then uh, not long after that, Darwin's book, Origin of Species, came out. And the rest is history. So to talk about natural selection and about the postulates that go into natural selection, I want to talk about a study that was done in on one of the Galapagos Islands, the island of Daphne Mayor, or Daphne Major. And this um, island is not a very large island, and it's small enough to where the investigators, these two individuals, Peter and Rosemary Grant, were able to basically understand the entire population of the species of birds on this island. And specifically, we're going to talk about this species of birds, Geospeza fortis. This couple, the Grants, were able to capture and mark every single bird living on this island of this species. They knew which birds were mating with which birds, and they knew the offspring of each of those mating pairs. So they knew the entire population dynamics of this species on this island. And they tracked this through a number of years. So there are four postulates that we're going to talk about. And the first postulate is variation. Is there variation in the characteristics of this bird on this island? And to do this, we're going to um, look at some of these. So what are some of the characteristics that might be important for the survival of the bird? Right? It might be that you have wings that can fly. It might be that you have camouflage. But the one that we're going to look at is one that has to do with their feeding habits. So in other words, their beaks. And um, we're going to then track, uh, look at the beak size and see if there's variation in the beak size. And as we do this, again, the Grants went out and captured every single bird. And they were able to measure the beak size by putting a caliper on the upper and lower end of the beak. So smaller beaks would have a smaller, what we call, beak depth and larger beaks would have a larger beak depth. And if you look at the measurements made by the Grants, you can see that there is indeed variation. In fact, it, it, there, it ranges from about six millimeters all the way up to, apparently there was a bird that had about 14 millimeter uh, size beak depth. But if you also look at this distribution, you can see that it looks very much like a natural curve. And that is exactly what we would expect in any kind of um, normal characteristic in a population where you would have variation and you would have most of the vari variation kind of in the middle with you know gradually depleting on each of the sides causing this normal curve this bell curve and when you have that you can also calculate the midpoint or the the average beak depth and it's about 9.4 millimeters so this population had that average size by the way this n over here refers to the number of birds that were counted in this particular study, 751 birds. So the next um, postulate that must be met is that those traits that are variable must be heritable. And heritable means that it, the, the, how that trait is expressed is determined by the genes, not determined by environmental factors. So in other words, bigger beaks were determined because those birds were born with genes that caused bigger beaks, not because, for example, they were fed more when they were little tiny birds, and so therefore they grew more and had bigger beaks. So how could we test this, this idea of beak depth is due to genetics and not to the environment? Well, the way that this is done is you compare the average beak depth of the parents, which we call the mid-parent beak depth, and you plot that against the offspring beak depth and if there is a tight correlation, then you can with confidence say that that characteristic is heritable, that it's due to genes, not environment. And if we look at just two of the years, we can see there's actually a really nice correlation between the mid-parent beak depth and the, and the um, offspring beak depth, both in years 1976 and 1978. So heritability was also met in this case. If it had not been met, 
we would see something more like this, where you would see the spread of points would have been just more randomly spread across the graph and there would be no tight relationship or correlation at all. The third postulate is excess fecundity or overproduction or more offspring that can survive or too many babies or reaching the biotic potential. These types of words mean that for all natural populations, there are just more offspring that are part of that generation that are going to be able to survive to reproduce. So there's always more offspring that are produced than are going to survive to reproduce. And we can see this in, a, in kind of an interesting natural experiment that took place on the island with these birds. There was a drought, and the drought caused the finch numbers to drastically decrease to around 200 finches. Um, and the other thing that was associated with this drought was the abundance of seeds. Seeds were not as abundant, and in fact, uh, the ones that happened to survive a little bit better during this drought period were seeds that were a little bit larger and harder to crack. So, can we say that we met excess fecundity? Yes, and just as, a, as, as an example to show that this is, this is how it is for all organisms, I wanna just do a quick example called fruit seeds of change. So to do this, we're gonna look at a um, Excel spreadsheet here. And I've devised this so that we have the generation years, the number of plants, the number of fruits, number of fruits per generation, number of seeds per fruit, and then the total number of seeds produced in that generation. And we're going to assume that one apple tree requires one meter of land to grow on, which is probably too small. We're gonna assume that, that a mature apple tree can, can produce 100 fruits. Um, we're going to assume that there's an average of four seeds per fruit, which is also low. And we're going to assume that it takes 20 years to grow to maturity and does not start even producing fruit until year 20. So even though, of course, apple trees can produce fruit much earlier than that. So with all of those low um, goal, you know, the, the much lower than how it really is, let's just put these numbers in and see what happens. So we're going to start off with one tr apple tree. Again, we said that it can have 100 fruits. We said that the number of fruits then in that first generation is going to be, in this generation, is just 100. And the number of seeds per fruit, we said, was 4. And that then gives us this calculation where now we have 400 seeds that were produced. The 400 seeds all get planted. They all grow up and become mature apple trees. And then you get, you know, 40,000 uh, fruits in the next generation. Each of those only have four seeds, but then you end up with 160,000 seeds and so forth. And you go all the way down and you can see that the numbers grow very, very rapidly, very quickly. Now, if we also calculate the area of land that's habitable on Earth, um, it's really only about 29% of the total surface of the planet Earth. And so this ends up being about 1.48 to the 14th square meter um, or times 10 to the 14th square meters. So if we come back up to our graph, that actually falls somewhere, um, if, if we need that many square meters for each one of these seeds, it would fall somewhere in between f five and six generations. That's all it would take. And remember our generation time here is 20 years. So we're talking about 100 years is all it's gonna take if we allow every single apple seed um, apple seed to produce a tree that then produces fruit and none and nothing dies if every single offspring survives apple trees would overrun the earth in about a hundred years so clearly everything dies and the same thing is true you know why are we not overrun with frogs and flies and insects given the rate at which they can reproduce well it's because not everything survives okay so we've clearly then been able to demonstrate that there it was excess fecundity in these finches and there's excess fecundity in all natural populations so was there variation then in the fitness in other words did some organisms that had a particular characteristic have an added advantage at surviving over other individuals that didn't maybe have that same type of characteristic and because we're looking at the the um, beak depth, let's continue along that. So here's that original graph that we showed from 1976. Then the drought occurred, right, where many individuals died off. So we, for, we just over, um, we over magnified this problem of that there's not enough offspring, that too many offspring are produced because we lost large amounts of the, of the total population. 
And furthermore, we know that during that drought time, the seed variate the some of the, the seeds that were mostly available were a little bit harder and bigger. So what types of birds then are going to be better off given that scenario? Well, you would expect that it would be birds with bigger beaks. So did that actually happen? Well, if we look at the 1978 population, we can see there's still variation. It's not quite as spread out. But the most important thing is to look at the um, average beak depth of this population. It's now 10.1, whereas before it was only 9.4. So in just a couple years, the average beak depth have shifted to become larger. In other words, birds that had bigger beak depths were on average better at surviving and therefore passing on those characteristics to their offspring. And so in the next generations, you saw that the offspring on average had bigger beak depths because the parents that survived of those offspring were the ones that also had bigger beak depths.